for the witness and ministry of his sustained engagement in the contemporary life of the church as priest, scholar, and teacher. The University of Dayton is honored to present its 2012 Marianist Award to Father Joseph A. Komanchak. I have to begin by expressing my gratitude for the great honor that has been bestowed on me by um, giving me the Marianist Award. It was a little abashing for me to find my name added to those who have already received it in the last 25 years. I'm very grateful to the university and to the Marianists for admitting me into that glorious company. I'm grateful also for the opportunity it has provided me for some autobiographical reflections on one of the major areas of my scholarly and intellectual interests over the last um, 45 years of teaching. Someone asked me why I was retiring in 2009, and I said, I've been doing this for 45 years, basta. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, in the course of my life, I suppose there have been three major um, interests. One is uh, Vatican II, the history and theology, which th was the first course I was asked to teach when I went to, to Catholic U. I've done a lot of work on John Courtney Murray, and beginning, uh, my first interest was in the church, and I'm, so I'm going to explain how it is that I began to uh, think the way I think about the church. Rather than give a, a, an exposition of a grand, the grand encounter between faith and reason, I thought it might be more useful, since I think that issue in the end comes down to a, a very personal matter to try to explain to you how I came to think about the church the way I do. I was teaching at Fordham one summer, and a student asked me, do you know anyone else who thinks about the church the way you do? And I said, actually, no. And I said, that scares me in one sense. I said, on the one hand, on the one hand I said, it's gratifying. I said, I think I have something to say. And on the other hand, it's scary because if what I have to say deserves to be said, how come nobody else is saying it? In the late summer of 1967, I was on very short notice, which actually means no short notice, appointed to teach dogmatic theology at St. Joseph's Seminary, the Archdiocesan Major Seminary in New York. It's called, popularly known as Dunwoody. The other dogmatist and I agreed that I would begin by teaching a course on the church. It would not have been my first choice. The only course in ecclesiology that I had taken was a course in apologetics that was taught by a man whom I became very friendly with later, Father Francis Sullivan, SJ, at the Gregorian University in the spring of 1961. As was usual in textbooks throughout the modern era, the course was designed to demonstrate first that Christ founded the church Secondly, that the church had a hierarchical and monarchical structure. And three, that this church was to be found in the Roman Catholic Church. I do recall a fairly sophisticated explanation of papal infallibility, but a treatment of dogmatic elements in the church was to be reserved for a second volume and a second course, which I believe was never taught and never published. In any case, there was not much that was exciting about the course, and in 1967, teaching ecclesiology was not high on my list of things that I have, would have liked to do. And sometimes, actually, we should be very grateful that things do not work out the way in which we had planned them or expected them to. On the other hand, the fall that I began my few years of pastoral ministry, 1964, the Second Vatican Council had promulgated its dogmatic constitution on the church, and in my new courses, I was able to make use of Lumen Gentium and other conciliar texts to fill in gaps in my ecclesiological training and to enable me to get by until I could figure out what the discipline was all about and what to do with the course. From the beginning, the course included a strong biblical and historical component. I read what books and articles I could on the history of ecclesiology, 
and on efforts to make sense of the new phenomenon of pluralism in Roman Catholic ecclesiology. The subject of Avery Dulles's Models of the Church, published in 1974, which of course described how the old and dominant institutional approach to the church had been overcome, and in its place, a new ecclesial consciousness of the divine and transcendent elements in the church that had pro produced for better models. Earlier in the 20th century, the idea of the church as the mystical body of Christ had been recovered by biblical and historical scholars. In the 1940s, the notion of the church as the people of God came to the fore. And in the next decade or so, the idea of the church as a sacrament spread. All of these ideas were incorporated into the first chapter of Lumen Gentium, which bore the significant title, The Mystery of the Church, instead of the title it had in the first draft on the church, which was The Nature of the Church. And it presented that chapter, the mystery in its full breadth, from creation to fulfillment in the kingdom of God. The result was a new focus on theological categories. The church was the people of God, the body of Christ, the temple of the spirit. It was koinonia, communion or fellowship. It was the sacrament of salvation. Now, quite contrary to Avery Dulles's own intention, his distinction of theoretical and systematic models was often taken as a description and even validation of distinct ways of being the church. It became common to counterpose the theological images themselves. Mystical body was out, people of God is in. People of God is out, communio is in. And to distinguish and even separate the institutional church, quotes unquote, from the church as people or the church as community. The result was that the basic challenge posed to ecclesiologists by Vatican II was in danger of being ignored. I refer to paragraph eight of Lumen Gentium's first chapter, in which the council set out as if in parallel columns certain features of the church. It is at once a community of faith, hope, and charity, and a visible structure. It is at once a uh, Christ's mystical body and a hi hierarchically ordered society. It is a spiritual community and a visible group. It is endowed with heavenly gifts, but exists here on earth. It is at once holy and always in need of being purified. These divine and human elements, the council insisted, did not result in two churches, but come together to constitute a single church and an imperfect analogy was drawn to the mystery of the divine and human in Jesus Christ. This is the mystery of the church. Take away either the divine or the human elements and you destroy the mystery. The tensions or even opposition thought to exist between and among the conciliar notions of the church threatened to dissolve the mystery. To this had also to be added that many ordinary Catholics were having difficulty in understanding what these new and distinctively theological terms might relate to. They knew well enough, even from experience, what the institutional aspects of the church were. But didn't their eyes glaze over when one started using terms like mystical body or people of God or temple of the spirit? What could such terms possibly have to do with their experience in and as the church? Were they simply terms that the Bible or the tradition imposes on us to be accepted by authority, by faith, but really never expected to cast light on what it means to be a Christian within a community of faith. Terms that it would be insisted were not simply reducible, uh, deducible from the experience, like mystical body. There's nothing in, you know, apart from Revelation, you, we would not be tempted to call the church the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ. So those ter that term is not deduced from our experience. But on the other hand, it is a term for describes and that, that is applied by St. Paul 
to an experienced reality, the church, the life in common. There seemed, seemed to me to be something that needed attention here. On the one hand, there was the church as an object of experience, of experiences both good and bad, encouraging and dispiriting. Yes, it's true that in the creed, the church appears as an object of faith, but the church is not like the Holy Trinity, about which theologians may spe speculate until the cows come home without having to give much attention to Christian experience. We have no experiential data on the inner life of God, or at least I don't. So. <laughs> Catholic Christians are Christians within the church, however, and a theologian who ventures a statement about the church runs the danger of someone's objecting, that's not true of the church I know. What's the point to all these lofty theological notions? It's okay for the theologians if they so desire to go off into the theological empyrean, but it's got nothing to do with me or with the church of my experience. I've heard similar protests. Such were some of the core questions in ecclesiology as I conceived them in the late 1960s and early 1970s. What intellectual resources could I call upon in attempting to meet them? I've already indicated that my De Ecclesia course at the Gregorian was not going to be of much help. But at the Gregorian, I encountered the man whose thought and method would provide the framework for almost everything I have done since. I am referring to Bernard Lonergan, whose courses on, I, uh, who, whose courses on the Trinity and on Christology I took, whose book Insight I read one summer when I was a student in Rome, whose seminar in theological method I followed, and whose kindness toward pestering students I will never forget. I do remember as one of the most terrifying moments in my life when I was up and asked him a serious question, I suppose, but I was so far in over my head in asking it. He said to me in his reply to my question, I have no, don't remember what the question was, but he said to me, well, you know the Hegelian notion of negativity. And I said to myself, if I say no, he's not going to answer my question. <laughs> so I said yes, and went into absolute terror mode, praying desperately, please God, don't let him ask me what it is. <laughs> so <laughs> he was very patient with us. Lonergan saved my intellectual soul, let me explain. I had been a bright enough student and had had the good fortune to be taught in high school and college by priests who valued the intellectual life and encouraged their students to pursue it. And this not just as an end in itself, but also as something necessary for an effective ministry as a priest in the Archdiocese of New York. Excellent courses in the humanities and particularly in literature and history were supplemented by attention to Catholic thinkers and figures and to Catholic history. Two of my teachers introduced me to John Henry Newman, and that began a love affair with him that has lasted till this day. I also read widely in the works of the Catholic literary revival with Hopkins, Chesterton, Belloc, Moriac, Green, Waugh, Christopher Dawson. But that rich education in the humanities and in Catholic literature was not followed by anything comparable when we were graduated to the major seminary. The two years of philosophy that we took at Dunwoody were taught from textbooks in Latin that claimed to present the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas in various fields, epistemology, metaphysics, ethics, cosmology, etc. And I, do, I suppose I took their authors at their word that their manuals were actu accurately representing the thought of St. Thomas. We weren't encouraged to read widely in modern or contemporary philosophers who were made known to us mainly as so many adversaries to be refuted by scholastic syllogisms. It was intellectually very unsatisfactory and looking for something that might provide richer food, I turned to patristics. Our church, hist our church history course led me to the fathers and then to biblical studies, the latter because of the influence of Miles M. Burke the only true scholar on the seminary faculty. The fathers I appreciated, and Newman still, 
But after Newman, who could be cited as a representative of the Catholic mind? The summer before we left for four years of study in Rome, that's 1960, I heard the name of Bernard Lonergan when one of our philosophy professors at Dunwoody mentioned that we would be studying under him at the Greg. He also confessed that he did not understand him. <laughs> our first encounter with Father Lonergan was in his courses on the Trinity and on Christology. Constrained to write in Latin and to work within the framework of a neo-scholastic textbook, he nevertheless did his best to make use of contemporary biblical and historical scholarship, engaged in so close interpretation of classic texts, offered a dialectical understanding of the course of doctrinal development, and at every moment gave evidence of a first-class mind at work. Courses in Christology and Trinity did not provide many opportunities for Lonergan to display an engagement with modern and contemporary thought. That we were to find in his book, Insight. I read that 750 page book straight through in 10 very intense days in the summer of 1962 when I was alone at this college's summer villa. I don't pretend that I understood more than say a quarter of it, that may be exaggerating, but I felt I needed to get through the book all at once or I might, or I might remain forever intimidated by its length and its difficulty. Another reading of it a year later brought further light, but Insight is the sort of book from which one can always learn no matter how many times one reads it. But the years I was studying in Rome from 60 to 64 were also the years when Lonergan was himself developing intellectually, gradually working out the views that would eventuate in his second major work Method in Theology, published in 1972. Participating in his seminar on theological method and attending lectures he gave in Rome, we were able to witness his engagement with continental philosophy, and in particular, for me at least, the emergence into prominence of his attention to meaning and value as constitutive of individuals, communities, societies, and history this grounding the distinction that would have been uh, taken for granted by European thinkers between the Naturwissenschaften, the natural sciences, and the Geisteswissenschaften, the human sciences. How would I sum up Lonergan's influence on my intellectual development? First, I found his analysis of the structure and dynamism of human consciousness convincing and compelling and it has enabled me to keep my head above water in the flood of intellectual fads over the last half century. Second, Lonergan offered a theological anthropology in many respects similar to that of Karl Rahner, in which human transcendence was shown to be, in the end, a reaching out for God that was met and fulfilled beyond expectation or merit by God's movement towards us. us. And thirdly, it confirmed me in something I learned from earlier teachers, to read as widely as I could in as many areas as I could. Lonergan reminded me of Aquinas, as I got to know St. Thomas, in his intellectual courage. I'd love to write an article someday on that as being the heroic virtue of St. Thomas. Intellectual courage, not to be afraid to read a page of anybody's writings and I have tried to follow their example. Both of Lonergan's major works end with a similar comment that fox focuses on the relationship between theology and other disciplines. In Insight, it is the statement that grace is not a substitute for nature and theology is not a substitute for empirical human science. In method, the statement occurs in a paragraph that urges the church to become a fully conscious process of self-constitution. More about that later. To do so, he writes, it will have, the church will have to recognize that theology is not the full science of man. That theology illuminates only certain aspects of human reality. That the church can become a fully conscious process of self-constitution only when theology unites itself with all other relevant branches of human studies. When I put all of this together, I concluded that if theology is not the full science of the human, 
then theology is not or need not be the full science of the church either. And so I began to look for help, uh, look to the social sciences for help in understanding the church. The older ones among you may remember that the 1960s and 1970s were a period of tremendous interest in so sociology, in social theory. Secularization theories abounded, but works like Harvey Cox's The Secular City and Peter Berger's The Sacred Canopy became international bestsellers. What was called critical sociology arose to call into question some of the assumptions of mainstream American sociology. I became particularly interested in approaches that drew upon European thinkers such as Ernest Gellner and Alfred Schutz. I read other people at the time, I just made a marginal note, Richard Bernstein, Anthony Giddens, Russell Jacoby, Christopher Lash. I was greatly impressed by The Social Construction of Reality, a book by Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman, which not only studied how our perceptions and claims about the real are mediated mostly to us by our communities and societies, but also illustrated what Lonergan called the constitutive function of meaning. I dreamed of what, at one time of attempting to do a parallel work on the church. I even proposed adopting their statement of the social dialectic. This is Berger Luckman. Society is a human product. Society is an objective reality. Man is a social product. Society is a human product. Society is an objective reality. Man is a social product. I thought of adopting that and using it to think of the church. The church is a human product. I had people practically faint when I suggested that. The church is a, Christ, if you want, Christian human product. The church is an objective reality. The Christian is an ecclesial product. The church is a product of Christians. The Christian is a product of the church. It was natural then also to be attracted by a new phenomenon in biblical studies, the sociology of the early Christian communities. It was illustrating the usefulness of such comparisons, sometimes substantively and sometimes by supplying heuristic notions that focused attention and suggested questions about structures and dynamics that might otherwise be overlooked. On the one hand, such studies showed respects in which the nascent church or churches resembled other communities of the time and cast new light on social dynamics at work within them and in their relationship to the larger world. On the other hand, these very resemblances provided a background against which what was distinctive about the church became more clearly visible. Such studies enabled a study of a church in, say, Thessalonica or Corinth that is not based merely on St. Paul's explicit statements about the church but also on the ecclesiology implicit in the lived community as described and addressed. Try that sometime. Read, sit down and read the very short epist first epistle to the Thessalonians, which is our earliest literary evidence of the existence of Christianity, okay? written around 49 or 50, within 20 years of the death and resurrection of Christ. Okay. Just read that through sometime in a single thing and if, no, if nothing else, just pay attention to the pronouns, to the use of we and us or our, and to the use of third persons, and see if you can't get out of that some sense of what this new community was as a lived reality. There's an implicit ecclesiology there. Now, a paradoxical thing was that at the same time Catholics were resorting to, and I shouldn't say resorting to, flocking to the more spiritual and theological categories for the church, Protestant ecclesiologists were moving in the opposite direction. There were three works that particularly impressed me. Claude Welch's The Reality of the Church, published in 1958, James Gustafson's Treasure in Earthen Vessels, The Church as a Human Community, in 1961, and Langdon Gilkey's How the Church Can Minister to the World Without Losing Itself, 1964. All of them were attempting to explore theologically the human and social aspects of the church. 
This was a recent development in Protestant ecclesiology, which had tended to restrict theological attention to the divine dimensions of the church. Gustafson put the issue as one of avoiding two tempting reductionisms. The first one, theologians were careful to warn against a sociological reductionism that sees the church simply as another social body among many and as capable as any other of being understood and even understood exhaustively in terms common to other social bodies. Theologians tended to be less careful, Gustafson thought, of avoiding a theological reductionism, by which he meant the exclusive use of biblical and doctrinal language in the interpretation of the church on the explicit or tacit assumption that the church is so absolutely unique in character that it can be understood only in its own private language. These three works avoid, wished, of course, to avoid the first reductionism, but they were just, they were ju as, just as, con they were, they were as much concerned to overcome the theological reductionism. For example, Claude Welch stressed the subjective pole of the church. Quotes, the church may be fully dependent upon God's act, but it is not simply God acting. It is a people believing, worshiping, obeying, witnessing. Thus, we can and must make fast at the outset our understanding of the church as a body or community of human beings, albeit existing in response to the activity of God. In this sense, the ontology of the church, nice, uh, deep philosophical notion, okay? In this respect, the ontology of the church means in the first instance, the humanly subjective pole of the relationship. The humanly subjective pole of the relationship. Gustafson had a similar comment. The church exists only where the meanings objectively carried by the forms are subjectively appropriated and believed in by persons. And Gilkey identified as a category mistake the idea that symbols expressing the relation of God to the life of the existing churches are mistaken for the substantial elements out of which the church is itself composed, that is, the actual human beings who make up the ecclesia. This emphasis was sufficiently novel in Protestant circles that Professor Gustafson once told me that after his book came out on the church as a human community, uh, several people asked him if he was on his way to Rome. After all, wasn't it Catholics who were so interested in the, that very human dimension of the church called institutions? All sorts of things conspired then to give me a fairly distinctive orientation once I had identified the chief challenges facing an ecclesiologist a decade after the close of Vatican II. I would attempt to effect in the theology of the church a shift similar to the one Lonergan attempted when he transposed the terms and relations of a metaphysical psychology of grace into terms and relations derived from analysis of interiority and in particular from the experience of being in love without qualification. This move from substance to subject, as it was often called, although now one had to speak in the case of the church of subjects, would mean moving from considering the church as a reified superpersonal entity standing over and against and above its members to considering the church as, and here, this is Lonergan's brief definition, the community that results from the outer communication of Christ's message and from the inner gift of God's love. I would be elaborating what Welsh had called an ontology of the church by beginning with its humanly subjective pole, namely the effect in men and women of the word and grace of God. It was this new and distinct thing that I would try to study, the church. The only difference, as John Knox put it, between the world as it was before Jesus Christ and the world as it was after he had lived. It's a fascinating comment that 
John Knox meant. He was a, began as a Methodist and wound up as a kind of a high church Anglican, so high church that he would go to Catholic masses and receive communion. Um, but he has a, a section in one of his books in which he says, if you think, what was the world like before Jesus Christ lived? And what was it, if you want to take the year 25, and what was the world like in 1935? I mean, in, in the year 35, right? What was the only evidence that Jesus of Nazareth had ever lived? The church. The church. And he d derives this th the, the notion that the church is not something subsequent to the event of Christ, but that the event of Christ includes, as one of its moments, the emergence of the church. So that was another whole uh, set of books that I found exciting. Well, how did this new thing come into existence? Well, it consisted of men and women who had stumbled along behind Jesus of, Jesus of Nazareth on the dusty roads of Palestine, and whose eventual hope that he would be the one to redeem Israel had been shattered by his arrest and execution. But those same people had become convinced that this Jesus had been raised from the dead and made both Lord and Messiah, and they had begun to experience a new communal life. In Knox's terms, the church was the community of men and women who remembered Jesus of Nazareth, who confessed him as Lord, and who lived in the power of his spirit. And then they began to talk about him. Listen to the stuttering testimony of a representative of that first generation. What was from the beginning what we heard, what we saw with our own eyes, what we gazed upon, what our hands handled, the word of life. And the life has become manifest, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the life eternal that was with the Father and was made manifest to us. What we saw and heard we proclaim to you so that you too may have communion with us. And our communion is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things to you so that our joy may be full. First four verses of the first epistle of St. John. There is so much that can be unpacked from that paragraph that the Italian ecclesiologist Severino Dianich has made it the core of a comprehensive and large treatise on the church. In that passage, in those verses, there is the focus on the word of life, which is not just a word about life, but a word that gives life, that gave life to those who had seen and heard and even touched it, that is, had known it from experience. There is the invitation into this experience of life by the communication of it to others and the koinonia that is realized when others accept it as the word that gives them life. There is the intersubjectivity revealed in the joy of those transmitting the word of life and rejoicing because others had received it. And there is the vertical, transcendent dimension of a koinonia that is with God himself and with his son, Jesus Christ. This is the genesis of the church not just in the sense of its origination out of the apostolic witness so many, dec so many centuries ago, but in the sense of its generation from generation, indeed from day to day. To this generating moment corresponds the traditional designation of the church as the congregatio or convocatio fidelium, the assembling or gathering of believers. I believe that that is a primary designation from both a sociological and a theological standpoint, that the church is the assembly of believers. Sociologically, it fits with theories of community that focus on the constitutive role of common meaning and value. More on this in a moment. Theologically, it identifies the primary and basic rule, a role of faith in the Christian life and in the constitution of the church. There is nothing save the grace and word of God, 
prior to faith. To bring others to birth in and as the church is to, is to bring them to believe. And St. Thomas would say that the entire structure of the church is only as strong as the strength of its faith. What is the first thing that one can say about the church? It's that it's a group of human beings. St. Robert Bellarmine's famous definition begins, it is the chetus hominum, the group of men and women. St. Augustine said, ecclesia homines sunt, the church is people, or people are the church. By his time, as he noted, the word was also being used of the building that holds the people, but the proper and original referent of the word church is the people who gather there. Augustine was not unaware that there is a ch church that consists of angels too, but that church will become known to us only at the end when, as we hope, we are joined to them and share their everlasting happiness. Meanwhile, however, I'm now quoting Augustine, it is the church that still wanders on earth that is better known to us because we are in it and because it is composed of human beings like us. It is this more familiar church that is the object of my inquiry. Now that people are the church might be thought too obvious to be mentioned. But it's not rare to find people referring to the church in a way that seems to lift it above and beyond its members to a suprapersonal sphere where it is a distinct subject of attributes and actions. Thus, one often hears people say something like this, the church is more than its members, or more than the sum of its members, a statement that can be accepted as long, but I would ask you to also recognize that the same thing is true of any other organized group of people. A corporation's finance com committee is more than its members, more than the sum of its members. Charles Journet and Jacques Maritain maintain that the church is herself a person with a subsistence distinct from that of its individual members. I think that's a metaphysical abstraction. And it is sometimes matched by an abstraction out of history, as when Pope Benedict XVI speaks of the church as a single subject whose life knows no breaks or ruptures. She is, he says, a subject that grows in time and develops, yet always remaining the same single subject, the people of God, on its journey. I confess I do not understand that language. What kind of entity is realized through the communication and reception of the word of life that is in Christ Jesus. What sort of entity is realized? That entity consists in and has no existence apart from the human acts of meaning and value with which men and women receive and respond to the word and grace of God. It consists in and has no existence any apart from those human acts of meaning and value. The church is an event of human subjectivity and intersubjectivity in response to God's redemptive initiative in our regard. There is a church where to the degree and as long as those acts occur where they have never occurred, the church has never existed. Where they have ceased to occur, the church has ceased to exist. I'm trying here to spell out Father Lonergan's dense paragraph, and I'm quoting, through communication there is constituted community, and conversely community constitutes and perfects itself through communication. Accordingly, the Christian church is a process of self-constitution, a Selbstvollzug, a term that uh, Karl Rana made famous, well, I, what, famous is an exaggeration. 
all these things are relative. You know? <laughs> that Carl Rahner used in uh, trying to outline his notion of pastoral theology. A pastoral theology for Rahner was an explanation of how the church realizes itself. So Selbstvollzug means self-constitution, self-realization. The substance of that process is the Christian message conjoined with the inner gift of God's love and resulting in Christian witness, Christian fellowship, and Christian service to mankind. I was once at a university and a, the door of a room where a meeting was taking place had a big sign which read, event in process, meaning don't knock. Okay. And I thought to myself, that would make a great description of the church. Church is an event in process, an event in progress. And the event is the event of the occurrence of those acts of human meaning and value. But in one of my last courses on the church at Catholic University, I, when I suggested that the church too was constituted by acts of collective intentionality, one student objected that he wanted something firmer than that, something closer to the image in Matthew 16 of a church built on a rock strong enough that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And what about all those institutional elements? What about the sacraments, the hierarchy, the creed, the Bible? You talk about an ontology of the church, Father. Shouldn't ontologies be made of sterner stuff than human acts? Well, my reply is, tell me what this stronger, firmer thing is. Did not Peter, the rock, sink like a stone because of his weak faith? In what does the church's resistance to the gates of hell consist? Think of the instituted realities. Does any one of them exist apart from human intentionality, that is, from acts of understanding, judging, deciding? Do the sacraments exist? Does a sacrament exist except when it's being performed? And if we say that the sacraments are signs instituted by Christ to give grace, is that not a human judgment? What about the hierarchy? Is not its authority, in fact, co-constituted by those who believe it to be divinely established? What would a pope be if no one acknowledged he was pope? If you tried a definition in a dictionary, what is a pope? It, would, it might begin, the pope is a religious figure whom Roman Catholics believe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So the phrase, whom Roman Catholics believe, was, occupies an office established by Christ to guide the church, okay? Yeah, but, but Christ did establish the church, did establish, did build it on Peter. And I'd say, yes, I agree. I, I'm a Roman Catholic too. Yeah. So you and I agree. And therefore the definition's true. Okay. <laughs> this is not the same thing as it's true for Roman Catholics. Okay, it's not true for Protestants, all right? That's not, I think that's a serious mistake. Right. But I do want to say, I mean, what is a, what is a pope? How can you define a pope except in relationship to people who acknowledge him as Pope. What about the creed? Well, the creed is a statement of what Christians believe. What about the inspired scriptures? Who says they're inspired? Yeah, but they really were inspired. Yes, I agree. You and I agree that the Bible is a book of inspired writings. Okay. All those things exist objectively, but their ontology is subjective. 
consists in regularly, habitually produced and reproduced acts of meaning and value. The church is an event in process. That's why I do not like the distinction often made in ecclesiology between event and institution. That way of posing things is mistaken because it neglects that, that institutions are themselves events. That is, that an institution exists if people agree about regular and typified ways of doing things. And an institution ceases if people cease to agree that those, those things should be done and should be done in that typified and regular manner. Some of the objections raised against conceiving of the church in terms of its subjective ontology is the phenomenon known as reification, which Berger and Luckman describe as, quotes, the apprehension of the products of human activity as if they were something else than human products, such as facts of nature, results of cosmic laws, or manifestations of divine will. And the temptation to reification is all the greater in ecclesiology because Christians believe that the church is precisely a manifestation of divine will. The philosopher John Searle is talking about the same thing when he writes, it's tempting to think of social objects, by a social object he means a, a social reality or body or institutional fact, it's tempting to think of social objects as independently existing entities on analogy with the objects studied by the natural sciences. It's tempting to think that a government or a dollar bill or a contract, all examples of social objects, is an object or entity in the same sense that a DNA molecule, a tectonic plate, or a planet is an object of inquiry. In the case of social objects, he continues, the grammar of the noun phrases conceals from us the fact that in such cases, in the case of social facts, process is prior to product. Social objects are always constituted by social acts and in a sense, the object, the social object, is that just the continuing possibility, I would say probability, of the activity. What we think of as social objects, he says a little later, are in fact just placeholders for patterns of activities. And this priority of process over product means that an institution or, or social fact continues to exist only because of the continued collective intentionality of those who make use of them. Each use of an institution is a renewed expression of the commitment of the users to the institution. The University of, da of Dayton exists because professors and students came back <laughs> and decided to do what they had been doing, continue to do what they had been doing. Institutions last as long as the collective intentionalities, the common agreement and acceptance last. Now, I have been able to find some support for this position among theologians, in case you think I have surrendered to the sociologist. Father Yves Congar used to ask the question, pro quo supponit ecclesia. What lies behind or under the use of the word church? To what, or better, to whom does it refer? And you can ask this question of yourself. The next time you find yourself using the word church, to whom are you referring? Or someone else is using it. Okay. When on the last day of Vatican II, several groups of people were addressed, rulers, intellectuals, and scientists, artists, women, the poor, sick and suffering, workers, and young people. The addresses sounded very much as if the church stood over and against those groups as if it was something distinct from them, as if they were not part of its own reality. So one of them says the church addresses women and the church addresses workers. And Congress said, pro quo suponet ecclesia. Women are not part of the church. Okay. Workers are not part of the church. Okay. Significant, of course, that there was no address given to men.
No comment. Okay. <laughs> He wrote a book, Congar wrote a book on the church as sacrament of salvation. But he did something which many theologians don't do. After four chapters of exposition of the theme in history and in theology, he now says, who are this sacrament of salvation? Who is the sacrament of salvation? And he said the ready and easy answer is the church. But what do you mean by the church? When St. Augustine was interpreting Psalm 128, which includes its praise of the just man, it says, your wife will be like a fruitful vine in the recesses of your home. And Augustine said, well, obviously the person who's being praised at the beginning is Christ, and therefore the wife must be the church. And so it's the church is being described here as a fruitful vine. But Augustine then asked, but in whom, said in quibus, is the church a fruitful vine? And looking out at his congregation, he said, I know that there are some people here who are simply sterile thorns in whom the church is not fruitful. So that's the question I have always wanted to ask when the word church is employed or invoked. Said in quibus, of whom is this statement about the church true? In whom is it true? No, the church is not simply the aggregate of its members. But if what is said of the church is not true of at least some of its members, is not verified in at least some of them, what meaning can the statement have? Of whom, in whom, for example, is the church a mother? Mother church, a metaphor which has fallen into disfavor, in part because it was commonly understood that when someone said, Holy Mother of the Church, they meant the Roman Curia. For the early tradition and for St. Saint Augustine, for example, that's, that wasn't true. Of whom, in whom is the church a mother? In whom, or of whom is it true if what St. Uh, what Saint Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, that he betrothed them as a virgin to a single husband, Christ. So the church is a mother, the church is a virgin. Now, perhaps it's not just ordinary Catholics in the pew, but theologians, too, and preachers who wonder what such metaphors could possibly have to do with them or with anyone else, and who do everything they can not to comment in a homily on those metaphors. Right? But a preacher like Augustine did not shy away from the images. He took these biblical images to apply to the church, meaning the congregation in front of him. One of his favorite texts is the text of St. Paul. The temple of God is holy, quod vos estis. And you can almost see him pointing and saying, the temple of God is holy, which you are. And he would, went into the living stones of First Peter and all of this and saying, what kind of stone do you represent that the stones that make up this new edifice, quod vos estis, are joined together, cemented together by charity, etc." He didn't, I mean, he took these terms and explained them to the people in front of him. He explained how the church gives birth to new members and the acts through which she does so. So that, and here, this was the thing that actually blew my mind when I first read this. St. Augustine, Augustine says, each of us Christians is a child, a son or a daughter of Mother Church. It was the church that brought us to life, to faith in Christ. But all of us Christians together are Mother Church. Each of us singly is a child of Mother Church, but Mother Church consists of all of us together. We are Mother Church. 
And I actually want to do an article sometime if my, you know, Alzheimer's stays off long enough, <laughs> on how that phrase illustrates Anthony Giddens' notion of the recursive character of social bodies. But well, that's another question. This mother is not only a mother, but she's a virgin and doesn't lose her virginity by giving birth. What does that mean? St. Augustine looks out and says, no, I know that most of you are not virgins. Okay. But St. Paul says, I betrothed you, and, the, and the you is in the plural, as a, single, as a virgin, singular, to the one husband. What does that mean? Well, he explains the virginity of the church as its virginity of mind and heart. The church is a virgin because her faith, hope, and love are intact. And the church was, is a pure virgin because and to the degree that her members remain virginal in their faith. To Donatists first and then to Pelagians, St. Augustine claimed that the church, uh, who claimed that the church was without spot or wrinkle from Ephesians 5.27, where St. Paul says that Christ has washed the church to present to himself a church, a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle, without pimples or lines on your face. And his reply to this is not only to cite the Lord's command that the church, the entire church, pray every day, forgive us our trespasses, which means, of course, that there are trespasses that need to be forgiven, and not only did he remember the apostle's statement, if we say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, but he engaged in a conversation with a Donatist, uh, with a Pelagian, I'm sorry, and he said to him, are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. Are you a sinner? Yes, I'm a sinner. Is the church without spot or wrinkle? And the Pelagian would say, yes, the church is without spot or wrinkle. And then... Augustine would say, so you're not in the church. He says, no, I am in the church. He says, well, if you're in the church and you're a sinner, then the church is not without spot or wrinkle because you're the spot or wrinkle. <laughs> okay. See how wonderfully concrete this is. This is the way St. Saint Augustine preached. That's why I love him. I spent the last 10 years or so of my life reading, trying to read a sermon of St. Augustine every day. He left about... Six, 600 of them or so, which is probably only a fifth or eighth of the total number he preached, but in any case. All of it's wondrously concrete. As St. Augustine thought that these images of the church were true of his church, were true, that is, of the Christian standing before him as he preached. No one more than Augustine appreciated that this church was Catholic spanning generations and nations. But this church consisted of the churches, and these churches consisted of Christians, so that what was true of the one church was true in the many churches, and what was true of the church and the churches was true, if it was true, of the Christians. There simply was no other church somewhere out there or up there. Let me repeat that to say that the objective reality of the church is thoroughly subjective does not mean that it is not divine in its origin. But to say that the church is divinely willed, as I, we must out of faith, is to say that God wishes that the subjective and intersubjective acts constitutive of the church occur in men and women. Henri de Lubac rightly reminded his readers that even the human elements have a divine foundation. They are the acts and habits that result from God's will that there be a community of grace. But what God wills is that human subjectivity and intersubjectivity create a new collective entity, the church, which consists entirely of human beings eliciting the receptive and responsive acts. Now, at the end, I'm simply going to say that I've tried in some writings already done, published, and in others I'm thinking about, that I think this type of an approach to the church, which takes its humanly subjective ontology seriously, 
has a good deal to say about the existence and functioning of authority in the church. From Newman and Rosmini, the notion that authority, uh, that uh, the admiration, love, and trust of the Catholic people are constitutive, co-constitutive of the authority. On Vatican II, as an effort to become, for the church to become a fully conscious process in an historically conscious age. The theology of the local church against hypostasizing the so-called universal church, the precarious character of the church, the fragile character of the church. Authenticity is always a withdrawal from inauthenticity, and this is as true of the church as it is of each of us, which is another way of posing the question of the church as what Vatican II says, always at once holy and in need of purification. On ecumenism, where is the true church? What do you mean by the true church? Do you mean these institutional elements? Do you mean the reception of the grace and word of God? And finally, the common responsibility for the church's self-realization, which I sometimes put in these terms. Is it for you, the church, a noun, describing a reality that you speak of in the third person only? Or is the church something that you speak of and think of and imagine in terms of the first person plural? Something, in other words, that you are, something that we are. Does the responsibility for the future of the church lie in the third person or in the first person plural? Does it fall? that is, upon us. Thank you. There are two aspects to the Marianist Award. Each recipient receives a piece of art, and each receives a stipend of $5,000, and thanksgiving for their contribution as a Roman Catholic whose work has made a major contribution to the intellectual life. And Father Komanczak certainly meets this criterion. Choosing a piece of Marian art for our award recipient is always a rewarding and challenging experience. For this year's award, we choose a watercolor of Our Lady of Guadalupe, patroness of the Americas, by Marianist artist A. Brian Zampier, entitled Guadalupe Breakthrough. The original painting is in the Marianist Provincial Office in St. Louis. Brother Brian enjoys creating whimsical artwork and finds great delight in uplifting the observer's spirit. In the words of Brother Brian, the idea was to make an energetic and dynamic version of the Guadalupe image entering our world today. Our campus community has certainly been uplifted this afternoon by the dynamic presence and dedication of Father Komanchek. And so in the name of the president of the university and of all the members of our university community, I present to Father Komanchek the stipend and piece of art. <laughs> 